All right, today we want to talk about investment banking, uh, which is different from commercial banking. Uh, and today we have a guest, uh, Jan Fugner, who took this course almost 10 years ago <laughs> uh, and has been working in investment banking since. I'll, I'll introduce him in a few minutes. Uh, but I, I wanted to start with uh, just the elements of investment banking. And then I want to talk about changes in it that came about after the financial crisis of uh, 2007 through 9. So, uh, OK. The topic is investment banking. And that is a term. Uh, 20th century term that uh, first became big and important, I would say, in the 1930s, but preceded that by some years. And it refers to a business of helping other businesses create securities. Uh, if someone wants to issue stock, they go to an investment banker to help them. Or if you want to issue bonds, you go to an investment banker. Uh, it can be a corporation that goes to the uh, prof for profit. It can be a nonprofit corporation. It can be a government. Uh, I suppose even an individual who is incorporated uh, can go to an investment bank. Uh, that's the investment banking business. Now, it differs. It shares something with the consulting business, because investment bankers serve often as consultants. A company will come to an investment banker with a problem, and they want to raise money by issuing new shares, for example, to solve that problem. But if it's a good investment bank, they will do more than just issue shares for them. They'll talk about their whole corporate strategy. So in that sense, an investment bank looks like a consulting firm. But that's not, because they don't do pure consulting. They're not, that makes a distinction. Uh, maybe they're, in many ways, a favored consultant because they're, they bring money. Right? Uh, you, can, you can talk to a consultant who will bring you no money, uh, and another consultant who has his uh, hands-on money somewhere and that helps a lot. You know, the advice and the money together helps a lot. Uh, so uh, investment bankers are different from traders because they, they, they usually, usually they deal with um, creating something, about making a corporation or a government, making it work, and enabling them to do something that they want to do. And, and then being realistic about it and coming up with the money to do it. And so uh, that's how investment banking differs from consulting. And it differs from commercial banking in that a pure investment bank does not uh, accept deposits. You can't go to your investment bank and say, I'd like to open a savings account. Uh, they don't do it. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about a pure investment bank. Now, let me just give you something about, uh, about this business. I'm going to come in a moment to uh, pointing out that most investment banking businesses are not pure investment banks. But I, let's talk about what a pure investment bank does. Uh, it does underwriting of securities. Uh, that means, suppose you're a company and you want to issue shares. Uh, you need someone to go to bat for you, someone who knows the kind of people who might buy your shares and can vouch for you. So in some sense, it's a reputation thing. The investment bank has contacts among uh, people who make big investments. 
uh, and they manage the issuance of your new shares, and that's called an underwriting. If it's the first time you've in issued shares, it's called an IPO, or initial public offering. So you're a private company. It's just you and a few friends own the company, but now you want to go public. Uh, you would generally go to an investment bank uh, and talk to them about how to do it. And the investment bank would, uh, would solve that problem for you by doing an underwriting. So traditionally, there's two kinds of under, uh, underwriting. But it should also, there's also something called a seasoned offering. Uh, and that means for a company that has already gone public and it already has shares traded so that the shares are seasoned, uh, but you want to issue more shares, so you can go to an investment bank to do that as well. Okay. There's two kinds of deals. There's a bought deal, uh, and then there's a uh, best efforts. With, with a bought deal, the investment bank buys your shares. They go in and say, you know, we know that we can get market for your shares. We will buy them ourselves and resell them uh, on the market. A best efforts offering is one where the investment bank doesn't buy it <laughs> and doesn't promise anything. They say, we'll make our best efforts to place this offering. Okay. Uh, so those are the basic uh, things that they do. The, uh, the methods that they use are regulated uh, by the Securities and Exchange Commission in order to make the SEC in the United States and regulated similarly in other countries. Uh, so uh, that's the basic investment banking business. Uh, so if you're thinking uh, of where to place yourself, uh, I think uh, investment banking suits very well people who are, uh, it's not good for autistic people. <laughs> if, you, if you're autistic, be a trader, okay? Then you just get on the phone and you buy and sell all day. And you can be rude and you can have coffee stains on your shirt and you don't have to know anything about classical music, okay? But investment bankers are a different, I see Jan is laughing. Um, tell me what you know about classical music. <laughs> I assume that was part of your training at Goldman. <laughs> he says no. Uh, it's a different, it's a whole different industry. So yeah, if you go to the symphony and look around, you'll see lots of investment bankers there. <laughs> but you won't see any traders. You nod on that, maybe. Um, so it, 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 you know, one, I, we talk about uh, moral hazard. I think that an important part of what investment banks do is solve a moral hazard problem. And that problem is that companies are, who issue shares don't have a reputation. And so what, you know, what do I care? I'll issue shares right before we're going to go bankrupt, OK? Uh, we know inside that we're going to go bankrupt. So hey, let's just see if we can milk this company before the public knows it, OK, and issue shares. That's a moral hazard. And the investment bank is in business to prevent that moral hazard. They do the due diligence. They check you out. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, people are more trusting of the. So I think investment banking is built around trust. It's establishing trust. Uh, and so uh, that's how it differs from a lot of other, that's why it's important that these people be cultivated and um, impressive. They tend to be well-spoken. You know, I can ask Jan whether he agrees on all this, but it's my impression. You can tell when the investment bankers walk in the room. Uh, they dress differently. They look differently. I don't know what it is. It's something about uh, reputation is what it's built around. Uh, so. Uh, OK, the uh, investment banking industry, I'm trying to think how to present. 
Um, maybe I'll, let, me, let me just, since I'm talking about the nature of investment banking, and since we have a Goldman Sachs representative here, <laughs> uh, I put on your reading list a, a book uh, as an optional reading uh, by Charles Ellis. Um, called The Partnership, and it's a history of uh, the partnership, and it's a history of Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs was an investment bank until just very recently, and they, uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, they're still in the investment banking business, but now they're officially a commercial bank. Uh, it's an old, venerable firm, and Goldman Sachs emerged in the early 21st century as, I think, the most highly respected and esteemed investment bank in the world. Uh, amazingly successful and amazingly well-respected. Uh, Ellis wrote a book just a few years ago. Ellis is uh, on the Yale Corporation. Uh, he's uh, a distinguished businessman and author himself. And he wrote a book about Goldman Sachs, which is largely admiring. Like, how did this happen? How did this phenomenon of Goldman Sachs uh, come about? And uh, I assigned, uh, I suggested, I didn't assign, I suggested you read one chapter was called Principles, uh, and it, it says something about Goldman Sachs. Uh, and it refers to, in that chapter, uh, the chairman of Goldman Sachs, John Whitehead, uh, in the 1970s, wrote down a list of principles that guide Goldman Sachs. Uh, and Ellis seems admiring of these principles. Not everyone would agree. <laughs> it's a matter of taste, I guess, in living. but. Uh, Whitehead is not, I just looked it up, he's 88 years old and has retired from Goldman, must have retired some years ago. Uh, so what kind of an organization? Uh, Ellis says that the thing that struck him about the organization is loyalty. But that's not among, that people feel a strong loyalty toward their company. That's not a, on Whitehead's list. So Whitehead's list what is his first principle of Goldman Sachs? Our clients' interests always come first. All right. These sound a little bit like bromides, I'm sorry, but, but I, I read them thinking, you know, it is the most successful investment bank in the world, so this, maybe there's something beyond, I think there is something beyond platitudes here. Second, our assets are people, capital, and reputation. Okay. Uh, that's a coincident with what I said. Uncompromising determination to achieve excellence. Well, everybody says that, so maybe we'll <laughs> discount that. I mean, we stress creativity and imagination. Uh, well, those are, those are sort of uh, bromides, maybe. But I thought, then Whitehead issued some guidelines. This is also in that chapter later for Goldman Sachs employees. And these seem to be a little bit more candid. Uh, the boss usually decides, not the assistant treasurer. Do you know the boss? Okay. That, that's sort of something that I've, I've learned about it, it, uh, from my own interaction with people. The boss really does decide, and Goldman Sachs goes for the top. And uh, maybe this is uh, obnoxious. I don't know. They don't want to talk with underlings. You never learn anything when you're talking. Okay. It means be a good listener. The respect of one person is worth more than the acquaintance with a hundred. Uh, there's nothing worse than an unhappy client. Um, but one thing that, I don't know if it's on Whitehead's list, but I think it really says something about investment banking, and that Ellis says, is that they shun publicity. They don't want to be in the newspaper. They want to be known by the president. <laughs> they want to be known by a few prominent people. They're kind of social climbers in a way. But it's, it's all built around some basic principles of service. Uh, and they want to be talking to the top guy. And they don't want to be in the newspaper. Um, there, there's, uh, I was going to quote uh, Ellis on this. 
And now I'm quoting Charlie Ellis. I call him Charlie. I'm saying I know him. He's a friend of mine. Uh, um, Making money, always and no exceptions, was a principle of Goldman Sachs. Nothing was ever done for prestige. In fact, the most prestigious clients were often charged the most. Absolute loyalty to the firm and to the partnership was expected. Uh, personal, uh, the real culture of personal anonymity was al almost a core value. The real culture of Goldman Sachs was a unique blend of drive for making money and the characteristics of family in ways that the Chinese, Arabs, and old Europeans would well understand. So I'm giving you a flavor of what an investment bank is. Uh, you might be repelled by it. You know, is making money so important? <laughs> and if you are repelled by it, you probably don't want to work for Goldman Sachs. Um, on the other hand, there's, there's, they're kind of re respecting some economic principles, right? Working for a firm like this, you can make huge amounts of money, and then at the end, you can give it all away to charity. And you know, uh, that's, that's the new capitalism, right? So what's wrong with that? What are you going to do with all this? If you make $100 million, what are you going to do with it? You're going to give it away, right? And maybe, I, I mentioned at the beginning, I mentioned um, Andrew Carnegie's book, The, the um, Gospel of Wealth. Maybe that's what this is all about. On the other hand, some of them don't give it away, and some of them live lavishly. So uh, I don't know. Different people have different impressions of this uh, business. But I want to make sure I have time for our guests, and I'm sort of running out of I wanted to talk about what has happened in the crisis. Uh, there's so much to say about this topic, but uh, uh, maybe I should talk first about the first crisis. In 1933, uh, the U.S. Congress passed the Glass-Steagall Act. Which forced investment banks and uh, in, in, which prevented investment banks from doing commercial banking or commercial banks from doing investment banking. It split them in two. And it said, you have to um, decide are you a commercial bank or are you an investment bank? The Glass Steagall Act was the act that created the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the first national, uh, successful national deposit insurance act in the world. And part of it, it makes sense. If you're going to insure the commercial banks, you better watch what they're doing and, and prevent them from doing dangerous business. So the dangerous business was investment banking. And they, they forced uh, companies to decide. So J.P. Morgan, which was doing both investment banking and conversion commercial banking, in 1933, had to decide, what is it? Investment banking or commercial banking? So they picked commercial banking. And that means they fired all of their investment bankers. So these guys regrouped, and they formed another an investment bank called Morgan Stanley. Stanley was a Yale graduate. <laughs> and uh, Morgan was, I think, not J.P. Morgan. It was his grandson. This was, you know, Morgan died around 1911. Uh, and so those were two separate, one, J.P. Morgan, commercial bank, Morgan Stanley, investment bank. But since then, we've repealed the Glass-Steagall Act. Uh, and that occurred with the uh, Graham-Leach uh, Act of, uh, uh, what was that, 1999? Well, Graham Leach um, repealed uh, Glass-Steagall. And now uh, these businesses generally do, uh, they generally do the same business, both commercial and, yeah, that was, Graham um, uh, Leach was 1999. OK. Uh, since then, you might, as you recall, we've had a financial crisis. Uh, and in that financial crisis, uh, Glass-Steagall got brought up again, because it seemed that the crisis was related 
to a number of shenanigans that firms were undertaking. Uh, and uh, the government had to bail out commercial banks. You may have, uh, we've talked about this, and it's very controversial. So the question is, did these banks get in trouble because we repealed Glass-Steagall? A lot of people came on saying that. These banks were doing all kinds of screwy things uh, that were, uh, that were uh, dangerous, and we're insuring them, so it can't be. So a lot of people said, we have to go back. There was some inherent wisdom in Glass-Steagall that we've lost. And this was debated. Now, incidentally, I, I didn't mention this. Glass-Steagall was somehow confined to the United States. Outside of the United States, there was, um, I don't know if there was any country, but as far as I know, U.S. was the only one that did it. So outside of the United States, what they had what was called universal banking. And these banks outside of the U.S. were doing both investment banking and commercial banking. They sailed right through the whole century without being divided up. And so it, the reason why we got Graham Leach was that we started to, um, people started to say, you know, we're at a competitive disadvantage. We Americans are at a competitive disadvantage to Europe uh, because we can't do both. And they, they, they have more freedom than we. And so eventually, uh, in 1999, we, we said they could, they could do both. So the U.S. also became a uni universal banking country. But then problems arose, uh, and the problems were uh, Paul Volcker, who um, Paul Volcker, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve Board uh, in the late '70s, early '80s, proposed something called the Volcker Rule. Uh, and the Volcker rule was, um, was not a full return to uh, uh, it was not a full return to uh, investment of the, to Glass Steagall, but it uh, it would and this is now in Dodd Frank Act. Uh, it's section 619. It doesn't say Volcker rule there, but that's what it is. And it prohibits proprietary trading of, at commercial banks. Uh, and it also says that banks can't, uh, commercial banks can't um, own hedge funds or private equity. So that's the, uh, that was the Volcker rule that was put in. Uh, there was also another rule added, which is analogous uh, to the Dodd-Frank Act also. And this is in the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010. Um, there was a senator. Uh, her name was Blanche Lincoln, a Democrat from Arkansas, uh, who uh, proposed the Lincoln rule, uh, no, unrelated to Abraham Lincoln, as far as I know. Uh, and uh, the uh, Lincoln rule was a uh, Lincoln Amendment, and that is um, uh, Section 710, uh, 716 of Dodd-Frank. Uh, it says that it doesn't prohibit banks uh, dealing in credit in swaps, but it said swap dealers barred access to the Fed to Fed window discount window, and so it effectively it it prevents banks from dealing in swaps anymore. As a result of this. Uh, uh, Goldman Sachs has got to shut down, or it appears that Goldman Sachs, uh, the, the, the Volcker rule says banks have until October 2011 to comply. 
So it means that Goldman Sachs has to shut down. Well, Goldman Sachs had to become a commercial bank, too. So it's no longer a pure, it, it's, it's an it's a official commercial bank now. And because of the Volcker rule, it appears that it has to shut down its proprietary trading, uh, which was a huge part of its uh, profits. Uh, and Goldman Sachs will never be the same again, apparently. Uh, but it's not clear what will happen. It depends all on how Dodd-Frank is enforced. Uh, I think that uh, people in the investment banking industry are going to try to claim that some of the activity that was done by their proprietary traders, that is, people who were trading the markets on the... On the I understand true investment banking shouldn't involve the investment banker buying and selling securities trying to make a profit. That's not underwriting of securities, that's proprietary trading. Volcker Rule says that you pretty much can't do it uh, anymore unless you were a pure investment bank, but if you're a commercial bank, you can't do it anymore, and they're kind of forced to become a commercial bank. But they, they're going to try to steer around these rules, and I think that maybe they can. They, they'll redefine something that looks something like proprietary trading, uh, and, um, and, uh, and then continue to do what they're doing. We'll have to see. These things are long and arduous. Uh, these, you know, one thing that strikes me about finance is that it's so rules-based. There are so many laws, there are so many lawyers that you can never, uh, uh, nobody can grasp the magnitude of the regulations that these people live under. And, uh, you know, you see these landmark bills, but none of us understand them because the real content of them is involved in hundreds of pages of legal uh, uh, documents that uh, never cease to amaze me with their uh, complexity. Um, so, uh, let me say something about shadow banking, which is relevant here. The term shadow banking, uh, I think of that uh, as coming from uh, a term that I first heard from people at PIMCO uh, just within the last five years or so, but it refers to, and maybe it goes back further than that, it refers to a new kind of semi-banking system that, um, w w what are shadow banks? Th these are companies that are acting like commercial banks, but they're technically not, so they're not regulated as commercial banks. And in many cases, the investment banks were shadow banks. And I'll give you an example of Lehman Brothers, which was a pure investment bank. It's now bankrupt, it's gone. It was a pure investment bank, so it wasn't regulated as a commercial bank. And it, uh, this was before, uh, uh, before the Volcker rule, before Dodd-Frank. Uh, and they went bankrupt in 2008, and it was the worst moment in the financial crisis. Uh, why did they go bankrupt? Well, uh, there's a reading I have on your reading list by Professor Gary Gorton here at Yale, uh, who argues that Lehman, like many other investment banks, was financing a lot of proprietary investments by issuing repos, or by dealing in repos. What is a repo? That's short for repurchase agreement. Uh, and a, uh, uh, the banking crisis that we saw in 2008 was substantially a run on the repo. So the, here's what happened, according to Gorton and others who agree with him. Investment banks like Lehman Brothers were not regulated like commercial banks. And as long as they didn't accept deposits, they didn't have to be regulated as commercial banks. So they could do what they wanted. They were considered underwriters, so fine, do whatever you want. Well, not quite, but they weren't heavily regulated the way commercial banks were. And what Lehman Brothers started to do is to make heavy investments 
in subprime securities and other securities by effectively borrowing through the re repo market. And what is the repo market? It's a market in which a company uh, effectively borrows money by effectively um, selling some securities it owns with an agreement to repurchase the security at a later date. They're short-term loans, in fact, collateralized by some security that they own. What it was is almost the same as at a deposit. <laughs> they were short-term loans that someone could withdraw at any time. So someone wouldn't be some you know, ma mother and father with their small savings account. It would be some bigger, probably institutional investor. But you know, these were acting like banks, like commercial banks, because they could, there could be a run on these banks the same way there's a run on a commercial bank. If anyone starts fearing that Lehman Brothers is going to fail, they all want to take their money out, which means they don't renew their repos. And so uh, Lehman Brothers failed when the housing market, market declined, the value of its subprime securities declined. Uh, people who were lending its money, it money through repos got wind of this, and they stopped wanting to do it. So it was like a run on Lehman Brothers, and Lehman Brothers could not be saved if it weren't for a bailout. And the government had already bailed out Bear Stearns, uh, and uh, it had helped um, Merrill Lynch, which uh, was failing as well. And they decided not to bail everybody out, so they let Lehman Brothers fail. Uh, so now, uh, the reaction to that is that we can't let shadow banking uh, go unregulated. And Dodd-Frank is, is part of that uh, reaction. So, uh, so now, investment banking is substantially uh, altered by these, uh, by these laws. And uh, it's still, of course, it's a very important business. The United States has traditionally been the most important country in investment banking, but it continues uh, uh, th that Europe and Asia are also important, uh, very important uh, participants in investment banking. Growing, I think, uh, the uh, financial crisis has put a, uh, something of a damper on the business for, for a while, but I think it seems to be coming back. The latest news is that uh, uh, investment banking index business is starting to look uh, more uh, stable and prosperous. So uh, I think I will, I, what I want to do now is uh, invite, let me just do a brief introduction. So Jan Fugner took this class, um, I think it was 2002, uh, and then he served as my research assistant for a book I was writing called New Financial Order. Uh, so I got to know him better. Um, then, uh, well, I guess you, uh, the, the, the important thing for this lecture is that you worked for Goldman Sachs uh, and got to know people there. Uh, and now is working for Facebook, which is, you've heard of this company, right? <laughs> uh, and I, I thought it'd be interesting to have him back uh, to give his impressions uh, of what life was like after Econ 252, uh, of what Goldman Sachs was like, uh, uh, at least the old Goldman Sachs. Uh, and I, th I think, you know, uh, it's interesting to hear about Facebook, too, because uh, it's a different kind of culture, and I'm interested in culture. It's more of a tech uh, uh, business. Uh, I'm interested to hear if they have uh, anything like the Goldman Sachs principles, <laughs> where they enunciate them the same way. So I'll bring uh, Jan up, and I'll let him uh, continue. Great. Well, thank you, Professor Schiller. And uh, Professor Schiller has promised that I'll be uh, well-spoken and well-dressed and a bunch of other <laughs> things, uh, good, bad, or otherwise. Uh, not sure if I'll live up to any of those expectations, but hopefully can share a little bit about this business. So how many of you are considering going into investment banking? 
maybe about 30% or so. Okay. Uh, and how many of you are on Facebook? <laughs> okay. And, and how many of you uh, are considering working at Facebook? Okay. So maybe we'll add a few more to that by the end of this. Um, goal for the next half hour is really to help you think about whether banking might be uh, the right next step for you after college. Uh, and for those of you who say yes, uh, to share a few uh, tips on how to think about getting into the business. So I'll give a little bit of my background, kind of as context uh, for my reflections uh, on the industry so you can take them with a grain of salt. Um, share some anecdotes from banking during the debt boom. Uh, and then also uh, give a few tips for steps that you can take today if you're interested in it. Um, so a little on my background, junior uh, summer. I went and worked at a large investment bank, as Professor Schiller mentioned, uh, and I really enjoyed the work, knew that I wanted to go back to it. Um, but I had never lived abroad because, as you all know, your junior year here at Yale, there's a lot going on with extracurriculars, and so many people don't go abroad. I went to see Charles Hill. Now, how many folks are familiar with Charles Hill? Um, fabulous negotiator. And I said, Professor Hill, how can I negotiate to go back to this job a year later so I can do a Fulbright in the meantime? So he taught me all this jujitsu, and it ended up working out. Uh, and I did a year in uh, Norway, uh, and then came back full time to banking. Now, as you probably know, a lot of analysts go into banking. They do it for two years, maybe do private equity, hedge fund, maybe do an MBA afterwards. And something like 15% might stay on, get promoted, and become career track bankers. When I was working on Wall Street, this was the peak of the most recent private equity boom uh, and the associated debt boom. And so recruiting to private equity had reached such a fever pitch that literally 16 months before the start date for these jobs, analysts were getting calls from recruiters, doing interviews, and actually making commitments to join these companies. Uh, and I knew I was interested in tech, and so I became very close to signing with a technology private equity fund uh, that I admire still very much to this day. But I actually decided that I wanted to work in tech itself. Uh, and so the last three and a half years, uh, as you mentioned, I've been working uh, at Facebook, working on our social advertising strategy. Um, so a little bit about inside the banking role. Uh, it may sound a little bit funny to talk about the investment banking division of an investment bank, but that's what we'll do for the next 15 minutes. And by that, I really mean just uh, the part of the business that Professor Schiller mentioned, giving advice to CEOs and CFOs uh, about financing and mergers and acquisitions. Um, so if you see this logo, and that makes you smile, I see a few smiles, maybe a couple grimaces. Um, if it makes you smile, that's a good sign that banking may be for you. You think about two, three, four. They don't four, understand that. That's an Excel logo. That's right? an Excel logo. What are you and driving? <laughs> that's an Excel logo, and these are Excel models, uh, and, and they go on and on. Um, you mean you're going to be a nerd? Is that, <laughs> is that what you're saying? Yeah, if, if by that you mean you want to feel comfortable with the technical aspect of the role, yeah, absolutely. Um, so especially, especially at the junior level where um, you mentioned some of the relationship aspects of banking, but at the junior level, really your core responsibility um, is, is building out these models. So if you think about working on that till four in the morning, maybe two nights in a row, maybe 20 nights in a row, um, and that's exciting to you, um, that's, a, that's a good sign. Um, so how many of you um, have gone online uh, to, to open Yale to see Stephen Schwartzman's talk from this class three years ago? One, two, uh, two enterprising users of the internet um, would strongly encourage everyone to do that. Um, one of the things that he talks about is that in banking, there's not a ton of flexibility for getting the numbers wrong. As the analyst, you really need to nail the details. Uh, and primarily, what we're talking about there is building operating, transaction, and valuation models uh, that describe your clients and other companies in their industry. Uh, and then the information from those models, along with uh, research you find by hook and by crook on the internet from your colleagues, um, wherever you can, kind of comes together into presentations, polished pitch books to help win a piece of business. Uh, so that could be an IPO. Uh, a merger advisory, as you mentioned. Um, and once you've won that piece of business, then you as the analyst really are the organizing principle for getting this deal across the finish line, dealing with the accountants, working with the lawyers, other bankers, even competitors who might also be working on the deal. And then, of course, your client and whichever counterparty your client is selling to or buying from. 
So it's a fair amount of responsibility. Um, typical investment banking deal team, the core team is pretty lean, maybe one each of an analyst, associate, VP, and MD. Uh, and if you decide to and are, are given the opportunity to continue uh, working in investment banking on a career basis, um, then you will gain a little bit more control over your week-to-week -week and month-to-month -month schedule as you become more senior. But even at a senior level, investment banking is really considered an always-on-call client service profession. Now, one of the advantages of this very lean deal team is that there's plenty of responsibility to go around. So if you raise your hand and say, yeah, I can take on some of this work that might by default fall to my associate, and you do it without making mistakes, you're going to be able to get more and more responsibility, learn more and more on the job. So one of my favorite projects that I worked on was a proposed venture capital transaction uh, where we were looking at investing in eight different operating companies. And because the team was that lean, um, I was actually able to basically take on uh, leading the due diligence on these eight different companies. Before you go ahead, well, why do the uh, managing directors have zero gray hairs? Well, I'm just <laughs> assuming it's all gone by then. OK. Yeah. That's a, that's a median. The mean might be a little bit higher. There's high variance. Um, so I would, was that the nerdy comment you were looking for? Um, so I, I, I might encourage you to think about these roles as an investment in your career, um, where what you put in, of course, is, is long hours, maybe 100 hours a week for a couple years. Um, and what you get out um, is a number of things, including a skill set that's really valued and respected not just in finance, but around the business world, um, exposures to CFOs and how they think about problems. Um, if you decide to continue on as a career banker, participation in the success that you help create for your company. Uh, and then, of course, a network of very smart, eager peers like the folks in this room who then fan out across the finance industry. Um, so as I mentioned, I was banking during the debt boom. And th there was such a peak in transactions that people started calling it Merger Mondays, this expectation that before the bell at the beginning of the week, there'd be a $20 billion or $30 billion, $40 billion transaction that'd be announced. And there was so much enthusiasm for this sort of transaction that even financial institutions, which conventional wisdom told us couldn't be LBO'd because their balance sheets were already so levered, uh, actually became uh, considered targets for leveraged buyouts. And arguably, the peak of this was when Blackstone themselves, one of the fathers of the buyout industry, uh, filed an S1 and, in fact, became a publicly traded company, which they are to this day. Your final task as uh, a banking analyst is to create a deal toy when you successfully created a, a <laughs> transaction. Uh, now, uh, this particular one uh, used to have uh, water in it and glittering fish. And at the time, I thought it was very pretty. But uh, I would just invite you, maybe, when you create your deal toys, don't picture your client swimming with the fishes, um, not, not the best idea. And then this is a, a safe for a bank, which of course is logical, safes are in a bank. Um, but this is actually an especially fun toy because you pull this handle here and then actually this one opens up. Well, I guess that was my idea of fun when I was a banker. So you, again, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, this is a snow globe, you shake it upside down, which is, which is a lot of fun as well. Um, but again, just in terms of the metaphor, and I have only myself to blame, maybe I was sleep deprived, um, I guess maybe don't show your, your client's capital structure literally underwater um, when, you, when you design your, your deal toys. Are you saying our investment bankers have a childish side? You say deal toys. I was presenting them as going to the symphony. What are you presenting them as? I, can, I, can't, I can't claim I ever made it to the symphony uh, when, I was, when I was an analyst. But um, a number of my colleagues were on the, you know, the boards involved uh -huh. philanthropically with those organizations. But yeah, I think that we have this creative energy and creative spirit. And I think there's a lot of creativity in finance, as Stephen Schwartzman mentioned in his talk, at the senior levels when you're dreaming how to combine companies, how to finance companies, how to deal with new regulation, as you mentioned. But at the analyst level, um, maybe not quite as much. So maybe there is that creative spark that's just trying to find its way out you know, one, one mischievous way or another. Um, but anyway, this was the landscape uh, when I left banking. Uh, that was September 2007. And then six months after that, uh, as Professor Schiller mentioned, Bear Stearns sold in a fire sale to JP Morgan. Uh, and then six months after that, September 2008, we saw Merrill Lynch uh, narrowly avert liquidation, become uh, the asset management brand uh, of Bank of America, which it still is today. 
That same week, Lehman Brothers collapsed under the weight of those mortgages, suffered a bank run, uh, and uh, was not bailed out, was liquidated. Some of their investment banking, capital markets assets sold to Barclays in bankruptcy. A week after that, uh, what a lot of people thought would never happen did happen. And Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley went to the Federal Reserve, asked to become commercial banks, which technically they still are today, as Professor Schiller mentioned. Now that having been said, if you take Charles Gasparino's account of this era, this was the end of an era for Wall Street. Uh, that having been said, you know, investment banking continued at firms all around the world, some of these diversified conglomerates, uh, and also at a burgeoning slate of so-called independent advisory shops. So these are folks like Evercore, Lazard, Greenhill. And if you're interested in learning about finance, investment banking is not the only way to get into it. Um, there are also, for example, the so-called alternative asset managers, private equity and hedge funds, folks like KKR, Carlisle, Bridgewater, who I believe still recruits here on campus. Uh, and then out where I live in California, you have uh, the heart of the venture capital industry, especially around the information technology uh, industry. So folks like Kleiner, Sequoia, Benchmark. Now they may not be recruiting on campus and they may not even be open to hiring undergraduates, but some of their competitors are. Um, so, if that's interesting to you, uh, maybe we'll just touch on a few steps uh, that you can take today. Obviously, you're already doing plenty of this without anyone having to remind you things like taking the right classes, doing well in them, um, researching the firms you want to apply to. Just three that I'll touch on, taking advantage of the incredible resource you have in the professors here today, um, which you really don't want to take for granted. Um, learning a little bit about yourself, and I know that sounds touchy-feely, um, but I'll give a couple of specifics around that. Uh, and then, of course, there's no substitute for, for trying this hands-on to see whether it suits you. So this is pretty much exactly as I remember uh, John Ginokopoulos, a uh, genius mad scientist. Uh, you can find him on Open Yale now. Uh, and uh, if you have not yet taken his class and it's offered next year, I would strongly recommend uh, that you do so. Um, David Swenson, I understand you've had the distinct pleasure of hearing from already uh, the most successful endowment manager ever, the reason that we get to have nice things here at Yale. Uh, and I just keep coming back time and again to pioneering portfolio management, the bedrock of core investing principles that he articulates in that book. Even if you never become an institutional investor and are only thinking as a retail investor, uh, still uh, incredibly useful stuff. Uh, and he does teach uh, a senior seminar. Uh, and then in addition to this class, as you probably know, Professor Schiller has uh, a graduate seminar, which I think you have promised to let students apply to get into? Yeah, I had about eight last semester. Okay. Uh, and how'd they do? Uh, that's an embarrassing thing. They, they did pretty well uh, they, against our graduate students. Okay. I won't rank them. <laughs> embarrassing to our graduate students. Um, but flattering to all of you. Um, <laughs> if, uh, as, as Professor Schiller mentioned, uh, I got to work a little bit on new financial order as an undergraduate. Uh, and uh, I just, still consider it such a rewarding experience um, because the, the tenets that you talk about in this book around how finance can be a technology for societal innovation, uh, everything from the micro level of personal income insurance to encourage people to take more risks early on in their careers to the macro level of GDP insurance uh, are some really visionary ideas. Uh, I, of course, remain dismayed that some of them have not been put into practice yet, but that really is an opportunity for all of you who are interested in finance for idealists uh, to think about uh, that as a, as a potential career option for you. Other useful courses, of course, anything with math, probability, stats, econometrics, Excel modeling, especially using the three financial statements, uh, computer science, computer programming, uh, is going to serve you well, not just in investment banking, which we're talking about this morning, but also in those other aspects of financial services, uh, like trading. Um, now, kind of switching gears a little bit, how many of you have either done Myers-Briggs or StrengthFinder? A few, maybe maybe 20, maybe 30 percent or so. Um, so these are tools um, that I think have become a little bit more popular in recent years, um, which are basically psychological inventories, where you spend an hour answering multiple choice questions, and then they literally spit out uh, a profile of how you like to work. Uh, there's, so obviously, there's no right or wrong answers; they're really just preferences. It's a pretty modest investment of your time, uh, maybe an hour each. 
to gain insight, not just into what you're good at, but also into helping you articulate to potential employers um, really what you can bring to the table. Uh, and then, of course, uh, where the rubber meets the road is actually applying for that internship or that job and, and getting your foot in the door. Uh, career services on campus are a fabulous resource, but because of that, they're a very scarce resource because almost everyone's using them. Um, so if you want to find jobs that don't get 200 other Yale resumes coming in their front door, you want to look a little further afield. So you've got things like um, lists of investment management firms from Institutional Investor, American Banker, Hedge Fund Research, there are plenty of these lists. And I'd say don't be shy about cold calling, cold emailing, um, just kind of be persistent. We touched on professors here. I, I am incredibly grateful to Professor Schiller, uh, Ray Fair, David Swenson, folks who have uh, helped me in my career, even at this extremely early stage of my career. Um, and it was really just because I asked. Um, and I'd encourage you to do the same thing, because. Uh, once you've left campus, uh, it, it gets a lot harder to get that help. Uh, and then the alumni directory. Um, how many folks have been using the alumni directory to, to reach out for jobs? Maybe 15%. Maybe um, I'd encourage you to do so. And all I would add to that is um, think about what you share in common with the people you're reaching out to. Think about whether you can reciprocate the help that you're asking for, even if that might not be obvious now, because they're established in their career and you're just starting out. I had a student in this class reach out to me three weeks ago, uh, interested in advice, and I was happy to share that. And actually, he ended up being really helpful, helping me understand where you all are in your decision-making process in your career right now. Um, so there are always ways that you can help, and, and then you'll find a much more kind of uh, you know, welcome hand uh, if you're able to do that. Uh, and then lastly, recruiters, uh, these large so-called 2 and 20 funds, the alternative asset managers, typically use third-party recruiters to find the talent that they want to interview. Uh, and they are typically targeting current banking analysts and associates. Uh, but there's nothing to say that if you have you know, a strong finance and technical background as an undergraduate, that you couldn't actually get uh, on their radar uh, and, and try to use them for a placement. The only caveat I would add to that is that you want to be really clear and confident when you speak to them about what it is that you're looking for. Um, because if you go in there waffling, asking them to sort of be your mentor and your career coach, uh, they're really not going to get that sense of confidence for you, and they're not going to want to put you in front of one of their clients, who are the, the asset management firm. Uh, We're having questions in just a minute. Oh, great, yeah. yeah. We're going to open it up for questions in a minute, but go ahead. And, and this should them. probably come at the end. I'm just wondering, who is Keith Ferrasi? So how many folks are familiar with Keith Ferrazzi in the room? Uh, some people, are, their arms are getting tired. Uh, maybe 20%. <laughs> so um, Keith is, was the youngest ever Fortune 500 CMO. Um, and uh, he's a fellow Yaley, uh, New York Times bestselling author, written a lot about uh, the role that relationships play in business. And you hear this word networking, right? Which I think all of us now kind of get a sort of unctuous feel around. Um, it seems very sort of like superficial and self-serving. And what he's really helped elucidate is how the basic tenets of psychology, and, and in this respect, he reminds me of Professor Schiller, applying the basic tenets of psychology to how you actually build real meaningful business relationships and breaking down this artificial barrier between uh, you know, relationships and business. Because business is relationships. As Professor Schiller mentioned, one of the things that investment bankers try to do is establish senior level relationships because it's ultimately individuals, not entire companies, who are making decisions. So just to share a couple anecdotes uh, about um, my transition uh, from banking. Uh, after banking, as I said, I knew I wanted to work in tech. Uh, and I very fortuitously got a phone call from a lifelong friend of mine around that time who was an engineer who had started working at Facebook. And what he convinced me was that I could help him and his colleagues change how people communicate. And I was uh, pretty uh, sort of anxious about this. Uh, pretty intimidated by the prospect of being a business guy joining an uh, engineering company. And what he told me, and I, I ultimately think this proved true, is that you don't have to be an engineer in Silicon Valley to have an impact. You just have to be able to think rigorously like an engineer does. I think the training that you're doing here at Yale and then the potential training of investment banking um, both have the potential to serve you well in that respect. So what we're trying to do at Facebook is give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. Pretty simple in principle, 
And our strategy for doing this is mapping out what we call a social graph. Now, we didn't create this. This exists out in the world. All we're trying to do is draw a mathematical representation of it. Um, and that's basically who likes whom and who likes what. And then we push information as efficiently as possible along the edges of that graph. So this is kind of uh, where I spend most of my day. Uh, not just over here in Farmville, uh, but also over here in Adsland. And what uh, my role is called is uh, local inbound product marketing. So to kind of parse that out, what we mean is basically I go and talk to local businesses, restaurants, plumbers, um, understand what their pain points are, um, what other advertising products they use, what they're trying to accomplish as a local business owner, and then basically synthesize that with data analysis and ultimately present it to the engineers as um, a case for what we should build next. So these are questions like, what do the ads that you see on Facebook look like? How should they interact with the rest of the product? How can we target them to make them more relevant to you? Uh, a whole bunch more. The real guiding precept here is that it's basically what Henry Ford said, right? He didn't want to build the faster horse, even if that's what his clients might have asked for. He wanted to build something that was dramatically more useful. And for him, that was a car. Uh, and for us, it's something that we call social advertising. Uh, happy to chat a little bit more about that uh, during questions if, if folks are interested. Um, so finally, just to kind of compare these two roles um, and, and how one might have prepared me for the other, I think the three things from banking that have served me best working on internet products uh, are one, this just cross-functional process management, which is a ubiquitous part of, of the business world. Two, uh, building polished presentations, this one notwithstanding. Uh, and, and three, being resourceful about tracking down data points to help make the right decisions. Uh, on the other hand, there's some parts of the job that were totally new, thinking from the mindset of the CMO, the chief marketing officer, uh, rather than the CFO, uh, the chief financial officer, um, just the pace of the environment. Banking is fast paced, but the rate at which products evolve in, in the internet is dramatically faster. Uh, and the fundamental job itself, which is basically creating new products, building the business case for them, validating that case with data, trying to actually mock them up, and I assure you I'm not good in Photoshop, uh, and then actually use those mocks in that case to inspire engineers and product managers product managers to want to build them. Um, so it's an environment that is much more ambiguous. The yardsticks for whether or not you're going in the right direction, especially in the short term, uh, are not nearly as clear. Um, but if that's actually something that's appealing to you, uh, then I'd strongly encourage you to check out jobs uh, around Silicon Valley and especially at Facebook. Uh, so you can actually go to facebook.com slash careers, quick plug, uh, to check out both the internships and the full-time jobs that we have available. Um, so, Professor Schiller, did you want to use the rest of the time for questions? Well, yeah. Um, I'm opening it up to all of you for questions. Uh, well, um, okay, you have a question back there. Before you did your before you did your junior summer investing investment banking, how did you even know you wanted to enter? I caught some of that, and then the, the uh, screen okay. caught some of it. So just bear with us for one second, and then I'll be right with you. You said before I did my junior summer, what did I do? Um, before you did your junior summer, or like, how did you figure out that investment bank field and went you? Well, you know, I knew that some of the stuff on the, the right-hand column of the, of the ROI chart was, was um, stuff I was interested in. I, I was interested in the technical side of the work, um, working on math, basically, um, but also interested in the relationship side of it, the strategic side, thinking about basically how you help these companies make bet the company decisions. Um, and during the first week of training, one of the partners of the firm came in, uh, and we use this term partner kind of as a term of art because, as the professor mentioned, it's no longer a partnership. Um, but he came in and said, you know, when our clients want to do really important things, um, they come to us. Uh, and when they want to think about important things, they come to fill in the blank name of top tier consulting company. Um, and that kind of action uh, and, and actually physically seeing the results that you create in the world was really appealing to me. Um, and I hadn't done Strength Finder yet at the time, but I, I did it subsequently and, and found, not surprisingly, that that's kind of where my psychological reward structure was kind of geared towards. 
of time. Hello. Hey, so uh, Peter Thiel, who was the first investor in Facebook and is currently on their board, is now offering uh, 20 people under the age of 20 each $100,000 to uh, drop out of school for two years and start their own companies. And since you actually work for Facebook, I was wondering what you thought of that. Yes, I think that's fascinating. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously I don't, I don't work with Peter Thiel. Um, look, I think whatever we can do to promote innovation is great, right? Um, now, if you're sitting here in this room and saying, well, do I want to take this risk of sacrificing this signaling device of this college degree and also potentially sacrificing some structured classroom experience in order to kind of rapidly accelerate how quickly I get into entrepreneurship, I don't know. That's a personal decision that, that is you know, for you to make, and, and I don't really have any opinion on it. Ultimately, for me, it'll come down to, do these companies actually end up doing really cool things and building really cool stuff? Can I add, uh, it isn't as risky as you might think, because Yale will take you back if it fails <laughs> in a couple of years. Um, we, one of our very early employees uh, was a Yaley um, who, who had had an undergraduate experience uh, somewhat like you're describing, where I think he had actually taken some time off to work on startups. I think he came back, finished his degree, um, and is now a, a partner at, at Benchmark, one of the firms that I had on that slide. But while they're thinking, can I ask you, uh, I emphasize the core values at Goldman Sachs. And it strikes me that Facebook uh, is totally different. <laughs> or maybe I'm wrong. Uh, can you tell me what are the core values at Facebook? I mean, does, if I were to read that list that I just gave you from Goldman Sachs, how would, it, how would it sound to the Facebook people? Yeah, so I think there's similarities and differences. Um, I think each of us has a core constituency who we wake up thinking about them, go to bed thinking about them, probably dream about them and know that whether or not we serve that constituency will determine the success or failure of the company. Uh, and at Goldman, uh, that was the clients. Uh, and at Facebook, um, our number one focus is the users and the user experience. And we care a lot about our partners, we care a lot about our advertisers, we care a lot about everyone in the ecosystem, um, but ultimately we know we have to serve the users as well. Um, so each, each company, I think, has almost a maniacal focus on serving you know, one core constituency, albeit they're different. Now, in terms of the day-to-day -day experience, I do think they're quite different. I think that um, what I'm doing now is um, quite a bit more uh, creative. You're uh, not doing creative. spreadsheets. Uh, a little bit, but <laughs> not, doing still. Not, yeah, not, not as much. Um, and I really love the, the creative side of the work. Um, if, you, if you think back to um, from uh, Stephen Schwartzman's lecture where he mentions that there's no uh, flexibility for getting the numbers wrong. Um, I mean, certainly we feel that the same way. All the analysis needs to be correct. But there was, there's almost an ominous tone uh, when he says that, um, whereas you know, the way that we operate is knowing that we have to move really fast in order to continue to innovate, continue to stay relevant. Um, and so that means that sometimes you make mistakes. And uh, it's no secret that we've made mistakes. And some of them have been big mistakes. Um, and, you know, we just try to minimize the number of times that happens, try to fix them as soon as it, they do happen, um, and just be honest about them and, and admit them when we make them. Could I ask a question of the class? You, you set the example. How many in this class are engineering majors? Uh, not many. What, what, like 5% maybe. What about science majors? That looks like... Yeah, 10%. Um, but you see, see, you're kind of in an engineering company, right? I mean, uh, I don't know exactly what Facebook is, but you're, you, you are, oh, is there some kind of division here? I mean, uh, why aren't there more engineers in this, in this class? I, or, and is that there sounds a, like a question for the class. So <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't ask them because they're the not here. All the engineers are not in the room. Why are you not in the room? <laughs> but I mean, is there, um, it seems like, is there a big cultural difference? I mean, are engineers prejudiced against us finance people? Or You're there, so. Look, I think that product design and software engineering is at the heart of the company. But as I mentioned, you know, I was pretty intimidated going in saying, huh, like I'm going to be a business guy here. Um, am, am I not really going to be able to have an impact? And I think the things that are important for the business people are, one, to remember um, what the core mission of the company is, um, which 
for us is really all about the users. Um, two, to have a sense of what is feasible, right? So you don't actually have to know how to write the code or even necessarily how to mock up the product, but if you're making recommendations that we should build things that are simply technologically not feasible, um, you're gonna waste people's time and lose credibility pretty quickly. And then three, I think when you do the analysis, um, engineers are gonna wanna see as rigorous analysis as possible, quantitative analysis when that's relevant, when that's possible. Um, and to the extent that you can bring that to the table, I think that's helpful. If you think about the business world at large, you know, one of the things that's just gonna be increasingly important is the ability to design, conduct, and interpret statistically significant valid experiments. And this sounds like a pretty straightforward thing that you might learn by maybe second or third year of college. And yet you get out into the business world and you'll find that many of your colleagues, whether they're coming from MBAs or other backgrounds, um, may not actually have that background. And so being able to bring that sort of rigor to the table, whether it's at a consumer internet company or you know, an industrial company, anything else, um, I think is very helpful. You know, I'm thinking maybe I should change the name of this course to financial engineering. <laughs> that would bring in the others. Because it is a, to me, engineering and finance have a certain connection. They're both designing devices. I think we have another question. Have you thought of going back to graduate school and how do you see that playing into a career like investment banking? Um, so I, yeah, I have thought about uh, going back to graduate school. I think that all of us want to be lifelong learners throughout our career, right? And there's a number of ways you can do that. Graduate school is one of them. Um, another is going into industries where you're just confident that everyone you're working with is really smart and they're going to push you hard um, and not settle for mediocrity. So you, you just know you're going to learn by that, that pressure and that osmosis. Uh, and then I think there's some kind of simple structured things that you, that you can do as well. Um, I threw a slide up of a couple that you can kind of do at, you know, in the comfort of your own living room, the Myers-Briggs and Strength Finder. Uh, but then also, you know, you can leverage having um, you know, a workplace to do things like peer coaching, career coaching, executive coaching. Um, so I kind of take a somewhat agnostic point of view as to like which of these tools I'm going to use at any given time. I just know that I constantly want to be challenging myself and, and constantly want to be learning more. Okay. I've heard a lot about um, issues with click-through rates on various social networking sites. So if you could talk about like what you think uh, the putative value of Facebook should be and whether like the current valuation is appropriate. Yeah, so, so happy to share a little bit about click-through rates. Uh, I'll probably uh, defer on the question of uh, how much the company should be valued at. Um, so uh, is, is, that, is, is everyone familiar with what a click-through rate is? Um, no, not everyone. OK, so this is just a simple ratio. Um, it's, um, let's say you show an ad some number of times to users on the internet. Um, it's the ratio of the number of times a user clicks on that ad to the total number of times you, you showed it. So if you show an ad 100 times and you get one click, you have a 1% click through rate. Um, and if you think about, well, well why are people advertising, right? Um, in marketing, there's kind of this concept of this marketing funnel, right? Um, which is it's just a little bit silly, but it actually conveys a useful concept of like up here is kind of like everyone in the world. And then here is like the people we can actually make aware of our product. And then here is the people who we can actually make kind of um, have an affinity for our product. And here is the people who we can actually make, um, you know, consider purchasing our product. And then people who actually buy it and then repeat loyal customers who buy it more and more. So we get to a narrower and narrower pool. And what marketers are kind of constantly trying to do is push people through this funnel so they can actually start with someone who may not know about the product at all and then actually get them to buy it again and again. And so marketers use a variety of different tools, right? Online advertising is one, but it, that represents maybe 15% of the market, but it's a relatively new one, and there's plenty of others that go back decades or centuries, things like you know, television, radio, print. And these different media play different roles in getting people through this marketing funnel. Um, and if you think about where online advertising originally grew up, it was really towards the very bottom of this funnel of, okay, I am looking for a blue iPod at the best price um, that I can either order online or that it's within five miles of my home. So I search that on a search engine. Uh, I see a list of vendors. And in that case, it's really important whether I click through. 
because that's basically the determinant of, of whether or not we get them through the next stage uh, in the marketing funnel. If you think about Facebook advertising, that is one of the roles that it can play, but it can also actually play throughout this entire marketing funnel, where we have a reach of 500 million people, and then you can target within that, uh, and then you can use things like social context telling you that your friend might really love a product to help build your affinity for it on through this whole funnel. Um, so for some of it, click-through rate is relevant. For other of it, click-through rate really isn't relevant. And you need to think about other sorts of measurement, things um, like companies like Nielsen do, like polling people and asking them, OK, you saw this media. Did it you know, increase your likelihood to buy this product? Or did it make you aware of the message that the brand's trying to convey that you weren't aware of before? So I think it's one of a number of metrics that kind of go into assessing the health of the business as a whole. I think we're uh, essentially out of time. but. Uh, let me just say, click-through rates and marketing sound like profit-oriented, but it seems to me they have a social purpose. That what, One thing is that capitalism is being transformed by this kind of thing because it gets people to buy things that they really need. It's like your um, strengths finder or, or needs finder. And, and uh, I have to applaud Facebook and other companies. Finally... I'm going to invite you back in another 10 years. <laughs> All right, this was great. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>